Hi, I'm George and welcome to part 19 of the Horizon series. Now this week we're going to have a look at some of the data in more depth from the previous two flights we saw in the last video. We're going to compare those flights to some simulations. We're also going to have a look at a bunch of other observations we saw during those launches. Uh, I also wanted to say a big thank you to everyone for your comments and suggestions in this series. Uh, some of those have been very valuable uh, and we've taken those on board and some we're going to pursue uh, further still. <laughs> Now, uh, this video is going to be a little bit technical, so if you're not into that sort of thing, that's okay. We'll see you in the next video. Uh, so anyway, let's start off by having a look at some of the rocket specs. The volume of Charlie is 7.32 litres. The weight of the pressure chamber with fins and nozzle is 1,301 grams. And the weight of the nose cone with everything including the camera, parachute and shock cord is 269 grams for a total dry weight of 1.57 kilos. The external diameter is 63.4 millimeters and the rocket has a 15 millimeter nozzle. It's also 2.98 meters long from tip to toe. For launch the rocket's filled with 2 liters of water and with about 20 mils of shampoo dissolved in it. We'll talk about that a little later. So the first thing we wanted to see if we fix the rocket bending that we saw back in April. The rocket looked straight on the pad when it was pressurized, but we wanted to see if there was even a small bend in the new rocket. We went back and captured images from a couple of the cameras that were on tripods near the launch pad. Uh, one photo was taken before pressurizing and the other one was when it was fully pressurized just before launch. Here's the first launch. And if we toggle the images back and forth, you can see that there is some movement in this view. This wasn't caused by the wind. You can also see that the rocket stretched lengthways a little bit. In the other view, we can see that there is almost no movement or bending. Let's see the second launch now at the higher pressure. Again, you can see some slight movement from this angle and almost no movement from the other camera. We're pretty happy with how the rocket handled the pressurization and so we are going to call the bending issue resolved. Let's now have a look at the flight data from the altimeters. We'll be using the Fuse app that lets you compare data from various sources. We'll be using this later as well to compare real data to simulations. Here's the altitude plot from the first flight. This data was captured with the Zlog Mod 6 altimeter from Hexpert Systems. It samples at 10 Hz and has a vertical resolution of 1 foot, so it's quite accurate. Now we've been using this one for many years. We can see that it was a fairly ideal launch with a parachute deployment happening right around here. The parachute was deployed by a timer set for 11 seconds, which was just a little early. On the way down, you can see the rocket slightly changed its rate of descent, perhaps due to a thermal. The altimeter doesn't measure speed, but it can be derived from the altitude measurements because the rocket's mostly going vertical. Here's the speed data. It's quite noisy, but if we smooth it out a bit with a simple running average, you get cleaner data. You can see there's a pretty huge spike during the boost phase that seems to indicate a top speed of over 600 meters per second, which is obviously not realistic. We'll talk about this spike in a little bit. For the second flight, we used a Stratologer CF altimeter from Perfect Flight. This one has a similar altitude resolution, but has a sample rate of 20 Hz. Other than altitude, it also captures temperature and battery voltage data. And the speed again is derived from the altitude data. We see that this was also a fairly clean flight with the parachute deploying right at apogee. The descent rate was pretty constant and a total flight time of 2 minutes and 25 seconds. In the voltage data, you can see where the Strato logger tried firing the apogee deployment charge though in our setup we only had the deployment configured to run off a 12 second timer. The speed data again shows a very light spike just like the Zlog altimeter and it's more than just a single sample error. We'll have a look how this compares to simulations in a minute and perhaps an explanation of why we think the spike was present. Before flying the rocket in the real world we tried to simulate it first to see what we can expect. Here we're using Dean Wheeler's simulator. A couple of years ago, with his permission, I ported his Java applet to JavaScript so it could run in modern browsers. The calculation engine is identical though. So far, we have found his simulator to be the most accurate. While most of the online simulators are quite consistent with their results at lower pressures, at the very high pressures, the results tend to diverge between the simulators. 
though we still use the other simulators for optimizing parameters and for multi-stage rockets. We can easily measure the different physical rocket parameters, but the one parameter that is hard to guess is the drag coefficient. This has a significant effect on the results, and so it's important to get right. For this, we first model the rocket in OpenRocket, and let it tell us what it thinks the drag coefficient should be. You can find the drag coefficient under Tools, Component Analysis, and Drag Characteristics. OpenRocket will also tell us what the stability margin is to make sure that the rocket remains stable in flight. Once we have all the rocket parameters, we enter them in the simulator with the target launch pressure and the amount of water we plan to use. I've added a couple of preset buttons to the simulator to make it easier when doing comparisons or optimizations. So let's pick Charlie, and all the parameters are set. Running the sim tells us the expected altitude as well as the time to get to Apogee. We use this value to set the delay on our parachute deployment timer. So how accurate is a simulation compared to the real world? Let's first have a look at some flights of the Dark Shadow rocket that has been flown over a range of pressures. In the simulator, we can just hit the Dark Shadow button to enter the correct parameters for this rocket. At 740 psi with 1.8 litres of water, the simulator predicts 2,002 feet, which is pretty close to the measured altitude of 2016. Here is a table that compares three more flights. As you can see, the simulator is quite accurate in predicting the actual performance. In the last flight, the rocket underperformed a little, but this was probably caused by some weather cocking due to the strong breeze on the day. All the simulated results were within 4% or less of the actual results. Here is an example of a dark shadow flight and how it matches with the simulation. This is the actual altitude data and here is the simulation one. The simulation shows a ballistic path because it doesn't calculate parachute descent rates. If we look at the simulation speed and then actual speed data, we can see that they too are a fairly close match. Ok, so how did the simulations compare to the actual horizon flights? Well, they differed quite significantly, which was very surprising because horizon is very similar to dark shadow and we would have expected the simulator to also give us fairly accurate predictions. Here are the actual measured flights and here are the predicted ones. That makes the error about 19% for both. That is significantly more compared to the dark shadow sims. And that was from two altimeters from two different manufacturers. And here is the actual altitude plot versus the predicted one. The measured altitude was 3,155 feet, but the simulator only predicted 2,551. Every time we get such a dramatic mismatch between the simulated and actual data, we want to know why. The first thing that comes to mind is did the altimeters measure the altitude correctly? So we wondered if there was another independent way we could get the altitude estimates to confirm that the altimeter was giving the correct values. And indeed there is one thanks to a phenomenon known as glory or Brocken spectre, uh, sometimes also known as an anti-corona. Now this creates a glow around the shadow of the rocket that can be seen from the onboard camera. Uh, we've seen this quite a few times before in our videos. Um, here's a couple of examples. Although the shadow is too small to see from that altitude, the glow is still very easy to see. We can use this to estimate the altitude using a little bit of trigonometry. From the Apogee image, uh, this one was taken just as the parachute deployed, so it's a little distorted, but you can still clearly see the glow on the ground. Uh, and that's right here by the side of the road. Uh, this is a top-down satellite view of the same road, so that puts that shadow right about here. From the drone GPS log, we can see where the exact launch site was on the same satellite image. And that was about here. Using Google Earth, we can then determine the distance between the launch point and where the shadow was at Apogee. Now that turns out to be about 1743 meters away. Now to work out the altitude, we need to know the angle between the ground and the sun, because the sun casts the shadow. In order to work out the angle, we have to know what time of day the launch happened, and we can get that from the timestamps from the videos and photos. 
and that turns out to be 8.05 in the morning on the 29th of September. We can then have a look at this website that can calculate the sun's elevation angle at a particular location, date and time. So putting in the location like this and the launch time and date like this, we get the sun's elevation angle down here at 29.45 degrees. Now, assuming the rocket went directly vertical, and it mostly did, we do a bit of trigonometry to estimate the altitude. And we get an altitude estimate of 984 meters, or 3,228 feet above ground, which is a little bit higher than the measured altitude, but it is within 2% of what the altimeter said which is pretty good considering the uncertainties involved in this alternate estimate. The one thing it does show, however, is that the altimeter readings were accurate, and so there must have been something that improved the rocket's performance that we didn't take into account in the simulations. There are two things we can think of. During initial design in open rocket, we noticed that the drag coefficient could be improved by polishing the rocket. For this reason, we used car wax on the entire rocket and polished it with a number of coats. For Charlie, this means going from a drag coefficient of 0.69 to 0.62. Rerunning the simulations, this improved the simulated altitude by over 100 feet, but we still had an error of around 15%. The second and more significant improvement was adding shampoo to the water to make foam. We mostly added the foam to the rocket, hoping that it would help with cooling. The thinking was that the large surface area of all the bubbles would help cool the compressing air. But from previous experience, we know that you can get a measurable performance boost with foam. On day 144, we did some foam versus water only comparisons in low pressure rockets, and there the performance boost was as much as 30%, even with large nozzles. Anti-gravity research also used foam on their record setting flights many years ago. Although they used 30% detergent concentrations, we found that 1-2% to is sufficient to get most of the gain. We dissolved just 20 ml of shampoo in the 2 litres of water for these flights. Foam is something I haven't seen any simulators support. I'm not sure how you would even model it because of the broad range of possible variables. I think it would be an interesting research project in its own right. Anyone out there who wants to tackle this problem? We can see that foam is being expelled from Horizon by comparing the plume coming out of the nozzle. Here is dark shadow with water only. You can see a nice straight column of water coming out of the nozzle, and you can also clearly see when the water runs out and the air pulse begins. As you can see, the plume is very different for Horizon, and is very similar to other foam launches we've done. You can also see how much longer the plume was in these videos. It extends perhaps 50 to 70 meters. For the second flight, we can also see that the foam started even before it left the guide rail. I think the most revealing view is when you zoom in on this image. You can see the foam rapidly expanding as it leaves the nozzle. You can probably guess what we need to do to the nozzle to improve performance even further. So let's have a look at the spikes in the speed measurements for both horizon flights. When we look back at the dark shadow data, we can see that the speed values were reasonable and they also fit well with the simulations. Now, when we look at the two Horizon flights, we see the drastic spike that lasts about one second over multiple samples. Because the two different altimeters detected this spike in two flights, something else must be going on. We suspect it may be due to how the altimeters are mounted in the nose cone. The altimeter is mounted very close to the tip inside the nose cone. There is one main vent hole just below the camera lens, and a couple of small ones where the retaining levers emerge out of the frame down here. The rest of the nose cone is sealed. It is possible that high speed airflow over the lens creates low pressure just below the lens here, where the vent hole is, and sucks air out of the nose cone. This drop in pressure would be detected as a gain in altitude. I've read several forum posts where people discuss mounting barometric altimeters in nose cones and reporting that they get quite noisy data during the boost phase, but it settles down again during the slower part of the coast phase. The final altitude reading isn't affected because the pressure equalizes at the slower speeds near apogee. Normally it is recommended that vent holes be located well below the shoulder of the nose cone on the cylindrical part of the payload bay. This is in fact the way we have it on Dark Shadow, which doesn't show these large spikes. 
and the altimeter is located down here as well. Another contributing factor could be the high acceleration. The air in the nose cone also undergoes acceleration and compresses towards the lower part of the nose cone, creating a lower pressure near the top. This would also be sensed as a rapid climb in altitude and the data seems to support this. As soon as the boost is over, the pressure in the nose cone is no longer compressed near the bottom and the pressure equalizes again and this again we see in the speed data where the spike comes back down just after the boost. We believe the spikes are caused by a combination of these two factors, though we would be happy to hear suggestions for other possible causes. So how fast did the rocket go? Comparing the real data to the simulated values, we can see that the predicted speed matches quite well with the actual readings in this part of the flight. Because the rocket went higher than predicted, the top speed would have been a little higher as well. We're going to say somewhere close to the 165 meters per second, or 595 kilometers an hour. We're going to make a slight modification to the nose cone and plug the vent hole below the camera lens. Then drill a couple of larger holes in the base of the nose cone and then add vent holes in the side of the payload bay and see how that affects the readings on the next flights. In terms of top acceleration, we're going to derive that from the simulator data as well. The simulator says it was around 80 G, so we'll add a little bit for the higher rocket performance, and we're going to say it was around 82 G for the second launch. So that's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, hopefully this has shed some light on uh, the performance of this rocket and some of the design aspects. If you have any questions or notice that we stuffed up somewhere, please let us know in the comments below. In the next video, we're going to have a look at the Horizons first stage launcher. So anyway, that's all for this week. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.